Welcome back everyone to another reaction video. Well, I am excited to go right back to History Matters because man, did you guys love it yesterday. The, uh, the click rate and the number of views on my first look at History Matters was really, really good. It was one of the best performing videos we've had in a long time. And a number of you said, hey, you know, he's got a lot of stuff that uh, is 10 minutes long. It's longer than the short video we looked at yesterday. So I thought we would stick with the theme uh, that we kind of had yesterday and continue to look at the British Empire. We're going to take a look at 10 minute history, the early British Empire. Before we dive into that, just a couple of quick things. Number one, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and turning on notifications. Only about 20% of you have all the notifications on, and only about a third of the people who watch these videos are actually subscribed. So I would greatly appreciate that. Uh, as well as, I want to invite you, even if you've looked at it in the past, even if you're an existing member on Patreon, to consider looking at Patreon and becoming a supporter through there. Uh, as of today, a bunch of revamping has been done to our Patreon. I've added a couple of new tiers. I've added some new benefits to the tiers uh, that exist. So there's a lot of perks available. Uh, there's a lot of uh, new things that I'm going to be doing with our Patreon patrons. We currently have 244 patrons at the time I'm making this video. I'd like to double that to 500 uh, if possible by the end of the year. So I want to invite you to be a part of that. Uh, thank you to everybody who listened to my suggestion and subscribed to History Matters. Between the time I recorded the video yesterday and I uploaded the video yesterday, History Matters actually hit 1 million subscribers. So congratulations to them for that. Please consider uh, checking out Patreon and uh, we'll see you at the end of this video to talk a little more, more about that. Fourteen ninety seven and the British Empire didn't exist, neither did Britain. England was the largest and most powerful country in the British Isles at this time. Wales, the Isle of Man and a piece of Ireland called the Pale were firmly under English control. The rest of Ireland was mostly independent, only giving lip service to the English monarchy, and in the north, Scotland remained independent and a close ally of France. King Henry the Seventh of England wished to improve England's trading situation. The English were not exactly renowned sailors at this point, and so Henry did what everyone else did at the time, hired an Italian. A certain Giovanni... <laughs> he did what everyone else did. He hired an Italian. Henry Tudor, to his credit, he did a really good job of getting the finances of the kingdom in order. I think he's underrated in that department. Uh, and he's largely forgotten as a Tudor monarch because of all the Tudors that came after him. His son, Henry VIII. His granddaughter, Elizabeth, are most remembered, but Henry did a lot of really good things after winning the, the crown on the battlefield at Bosworth. Caboto. Caboto was searching for a northern route to China, but landed in North America, becoming the first European to set foot there, at least since the Vikings had 500 years earlier. And the, what they were looking for, and this is something we learn a lot in the United States growing up in uh, history class and social studies, they were looking what was called for what was called the Northwest Passage, which was a way... Uh, to get across uh, without having to go down and around South America, a northernmost approach uh, to get over to the Pacific. Uh, and this was going on as late as the 1800s with the Franklin Expedition, where they were still you know, trying to look for uh, a way through Canada, uh, to, through the waters of Canada to get to the other side. Henry VII continued the long tradition of English monarchs and died before being succeeded by his son Henry VIII. Henry VIII contributed to the expansion of English holdings by incorporating Wales into the Kingdom of England and giving it representation in Parliament. So uh, 1542, I think, is when this is made official. Uh, they annex Wales into England. Uh, so it's, it's uh, politically and uh, geographically no longer exists as a separate uh, principality is what it was. Um, so and Henry being on his paternal side, on his male line, was Welsh. Uh, uh, Tudor was a Welsh name. And uh, so it was a pretty natural thing to happen. It happened right at the end of Henry's reign, 1542. Uh, this is the year that he has his, um, his fifth wife executed. Um, not his fifth wife to be executed, but it was his second wife to be executed, the fifth wife that he had, uh, Catherine Howard. And it's right near the end of his life. He dies in 1547. 
1534, Henry split with Rome, creating the Church of England, which would begin the religious divide between England and Ireland. Divorce, please. Later, no. He himself declared the King of Ireland, although in reality this didn't change very much. Henry was succeeded by Edward, and shortly after that came Queen Mary I, a Catholic, who married King Philippe II of Spain. Now, it's interesting he pronounces that Philippe, because Philippe's like the French pronunciation is Philip. But a ma this is a, a really crucial point in the history of England and Spain, where if one little thing had gone differently, the whole future could have been different. The king of Spain marries the queen of England, the, the queen regnant. So she's, you know, she's re reigning. Uh, she's the daughter of Henry VIII, Queen Mary, known as Bloody Mary in history. If they had had a child, that child would have been heir to both England and Spain's crowns. And so much like 100 years later, well, 70 years later, 60, 60 years later, when Scotland and England are united under one crown in the form of James Stewart, you would have had England and Spain united under one crown. And Spain at this point is a fairly new united land as well because it was Aragon and Castile. Those separate crowns had been brought together just a few generations earlier. An important part of Mary's rule was the beginning of the Irish plantations which saw lands belonging to Irish laws confiscated and given to the English for settlement. Mary and Philippe never had children and so after Mary's death in 1558 the crown passed to her sister Elizabeth because the English Parliament made sure Philippe was ineligible. Elizabeth was a devout Protestant and reinstated many of her father's laws which punished Catholics. And at this point you go from Spain and England being allied through a marriage of their monarchs to where now Elizabeth comes down firmly Protestant. Um, you know, Henry VIII, though he broke away from the Catholic Church, still considered himself to be Catholic uh, and actually punished Protestants, even had some put to death. His daughter Mary obviously was very anti Protestant, very much Catholic, but now England swings irrevocably to the Protestant side. And so now. She's a target, including especially from Catholic Spain. And the whole reason that the Spanish send their armada, which it wasn't just a naval battle. This was a naval battle that prevented an invasion because the Spanish were going to land an army to depose Elizabeth and and put her, her cousin, um, Mary Queen of Scots, on the throne, um, who was Catholic. And so this was a Catholic versus Protestant war, really. Much to the anger of Philippe, who saw himself as the defender of Catholicism. Spain held the Netherlands at this point, and the northern part, which had a large Protestant population, was rebelling against Spanish rule. England was more than happy to help undermine Spain's power, and one way the English helped the Dutch was by giving Dutch privateers shelter in English ports. So privateers were essentially pirates who had the protection of a government, and Elizabeth employed many. <laughs> there were licensed to pirate is basically what it is. They would be given something called a letter of mark, which was basically uh, a sponsorship by a country. And so all these countries did it. Uh, England, the Netherlands, France, Spain, they all licensed privateers. Spain had a growing colonial empire at this point, and there was a lot of trade, particularly in silver, between Spain and its colonies. Privateers would seize this cargo by raiding Spanish ports and ships before taking it back to England. The most famous of England's privateers is Sir Francis Drake, who conducted numerous highly profitable my uncle. against the Spanish. He also circumnavigated the globe and even claimed land in what is now California. Beyond privateers, England... Yes, you can't get it through a video without me mentioning ancestors. Francis Drake's my uncle, um, descended from his brother. I think it was his brother. Uh, and I actually descend from a guy named Francis Drake, but not that Francis Drake. Uh, Walter Raleigh, the guy that Raleigh, North Carolina is named after. And uh, he ends up losing his head as a privateer. He also sent explorers to that's not why he lost his head. Walter Raleigh, who set up a soon-to-be mysteriously abandoned colony Roanoke. in Roanoke Island. We're going to talk about that. Elizabeth also continued the Irish plantations to shore up the English position there. Exploration and colonization at this time was almost always reliant on royal patronage in order to get funded. English-Spanish relations were not improved by England's moves across the Atlantic since Spain claimed nearly all of the New World and also losing silver was presumably not much fun for Philippe either. Relations worsened when Portugal, England's oldest ally, had a succession crisis which saw Philippe crowned its king. The final straw for Philippe was when Elizabeth had Mary, the Queen of Scots, beheaded in 1587. The reasons for this are complex, but it was essentially because Elizabeth did not want Scotland returning to Catholicism. Yeah, and uh, not only not wanting Scotland to return to Catholicism, but Mary, in the event that something happens to Elizabeth, marries the heir to the English throne. 
Uh, Elizabeth has no more siblings. She has no more children. She has no nieces or nephews. So none of Henry VIII's three children who ended up on the throne of England, Edward VI, Mary, and Elizabeth, none of them had children of their own. And so now you have to go all the way back to Henry VIII's sister uh, to get an heir. And Henry's sister was married to King James IV of Scotland. Their son was James V. James V was the father of Mary. So this is um, a first cousin once removed of Elizabeth. So Philippe, now pretty fed up, ordered the creation of an armada which was to sail to the Netherlands before invading England. When the armada reached England, several skirmishes occurred, the most famous being the Battle of the Gravelines, where an English victory forced the Spanish fleet to sail around the British Isles in order to return to Spain. Storms, a lack of food and disease killed thousands on the return journey, and this failure pretty much bankrupted Spain. And Francis Drake was a, excuse me, a big part of that. He was not in command but he was one of the leading commanders of that battle against the Spanish Armada. The next year, England chose to counterattack and launch the English Armada under the command of Sir Francis Drake. The goals of the Armada were to destroy the remaining Spanish ships, stir revolt in Portugal, and intercept any Spanish silver. So, the English Armada was a complete failure and cost the lives of thousands of English sailors and was very expensive. It did, however, guarantee that England would remain independent. <laughs> Towards the end of her reign, Elizabeth made one last contribution to the empire and founded the East India Company, which was given a monopoly on trade with India. Elizabeth died childless in 1603 and was succeeded by James VI of Scotland, who was crowned James I of England. James's early reign saw the end of the war with Spain. And was yeah, I should mention that. If you, if you ever see that where they have two numbers listed... Um, like William the Third of England is listed as William the Third and Second because he was William the Third of England, but he was William the Second of Scotland. James the Sixth of England or of Scotland is James the First of England because there had already been five previous King Jameses in Scotland, but there hadn't been any in England, and so they're n they're numbered a little differently depending on which country you're talking about. And you know th that kind of thing remains to this day, where. Uh, when a English royal family member is in Scotland, they're known by often by a different title if they have Scottish titles. So the Prince of Wales, uh, Charles, in when he's in Scotland, is known as the Duke of Rothesay, I think it is. Uh, so they do have those kind of other titles that they use. It was marked by several attempts to kill him, most notably the gunpowder plot. James contributed to the empire by sponsoring colonial ventures. He sponsored another wave of plantations in Ireland, most notably the Ulster, Ulster Plantation, which contained many Scottish settlers alongside English ones. So if you live in the United States, you very often hear uh, people referred to as being Scots-Irish. And that seems really weird that you would merge those two, Scotland and Ireland, but that's why. Because um, these Ulster Scots, which was the, that, that's why you end up with Northern Ireland being different than the rest of Ireland, because Northern Ireland is Protestant and the rest of Ireland is primary, primarily Catholic. That's why it's because you had that settlement uh, from Scotland, these Ulster Scots, uh, who then many of their descendants settle in North America, especially in like North Carolina. Um, so they're, they're called Scots-Irish because they came from Ireland and they had been in Ireland for generations, but they were, by descent, they were Scottish. James also oversaw the first permanent English settlement in the Americas, the colony at Jamestown. Next was Bermuda, followed by Plymouth, which was famously founded by the Puritans who arrived on the Mayflower. So Jamestown was founded by the Virginia Company of London with the goal of making its shareholders a profit. The colony was famously led by John Smith, who maintained good relations with the Native Americans. And I, I should back up to the thing about the Scots-Irish. Pennsylvania was heavily settled by Scots-Irish and, and Germans as well. Uh, you'll see a lot of that. You'll see a lot of Irish names uh, for towns, especially uh, down around Harrisburg in that area. Um, yeah, people forget that some, some of the most notable settlements in the New World uh, were not, like, a lot of times we think of people coming to North America, to the English colonies, coming for religious freedom, which is what happened with Plymouth. Uh, but a lot of these colonies, they were actually set up for profit. These were for-profit companies, these joint stock companies in England, uh, that were coming over looking for ways to make money. And, and cash crops like tobacco end up being one of the primary ways that they make money. 
Americans. Smith was forced to return to England after being injured in a gunpowder explosion, and for a time, relations between the English and the natives remained peaceful. These good relations wouldn't last, and soon the English and natives were fighting, and after several wars, the English managed to push the natives out of the area. In order to grow the cash crops on which the colony relied, indentured servants were imported. In this context, indentured servants were people who sold themselves into a form of servitude for a period in order to pay for their voyage to the New World. Indentured servants were soon replaced with slaves from Africa since there was no obligation to free them and they were easier to obtain. Indian raids against the colony and rebellions against neglectful rule made it very difficult to make a profit and the colony was turned over to the English crown. There were many reasons for colonial expansion. There was a strong desire to proselytise and convert the mm -hmm. natives of the New World, which many believed would civilise them. Some undertook extremely expensive... And that's a, a thought process that existed pretty much up into the 20th century. The idea of civilising the Native Americans by teaching, basically teaching them to be white people uh, in their mannerism, in how they dress, in their religion... Um, and schools were set up. Uh, there was a really big school in uh, uh, southeastern Pennsylvania where they would ship a lot of the Native American children. They would cut their hair. They would basically just try to Americanize these natives. Um, and, and, you know, we can look on that now and think, man, that was horrible. You're destroying their culture. And, you know, we understand all of that now. But I think by and large at the time, a lot of the people who were doing that thought they were doing the Indians a favor, the Native Americans a favor. Uh, I don't think there was any malice in it. I, I just think it was ignorance more. I, that's not to say there weren't people who did have malice toward the Native Americans. Um, but I don't think that was necessarily the prime motivation for the Americanization or the Christianization of these people. Voyages of discovery, but the most common reason was money. Spain and Portugal had amassed huge wealth trading with their colonies in China, and England didn't need much convincing. Cash crops such as tobacco and sugar were extremely profitable, and even more money could be made on the return voyages via the sale of slaves to the New World, the Atlantic Triangle as it's known. Another reason was security. The money from trade, as well as large overseas populations loyal to the crown, provided extra manpower and money for wars. To support the slave trade, England established forts along the coast of Africa from which they operated, trading goods for gold, ivory and people. Slaves from Africa were also much easier to obtain than the indentured servants which came from England, Ireland or Scotland. So, an interesting, let's pause here and read the fact. He says the slave trade was extremely valuable to England, Britain. Uh, two and a half to three and a half million slaves were transported from Africa to the New World by English uh, ships. A lot of them never made it. A lot of them died before they even made it into slavery. Um, sometimes, for various reasons, they would actually throw uh, some of them overboard and kill them. Um, if they were sick and they were worried that they were going to infect the others or if for some reason they had to throw um, weight overboard, a lot of times that would be natives. It was just, it's pretty, not pretty, it's very, it's quite horrible from the very beginning how these people were treated. This was because of the numerous major upheavals across the British Isles, such as the English Civil War, which saw the British Isles briefly become a republic under Oliver Cromwell. The Irish capitalised on a weakened English state and broke away from English rule. Cromwell brutally and swiftly put down these rebellions and seized huge chunks of land and gave it to his veterans. So isn't it interesting, and since we just talked about some of this with the English Civil War, isn't it interesting how often people fight for something and then turn right around and deny it to someone else? Um, and this happens a lot throughout history, but in, in this particular case, here you have Cromwell who's you know fighting against what he sees as the tyranny of King Charles. Uh, turns right around when Ireland wants to be free from English rule and brutally suppresses the Irish attempt at self-determination. Just kind of interesting. During the Civil War, the colonies generally sided with the monarchy, leading the English Commonwealth to blockade some of them. Cromwell briefly went to war with Spain, who ceded Jamaica, which would form the backbone of England's sugar and slave trades. So long story short, Cromwell died and the monarchy was restored under Charles II, who in terms of empire managed to gain New Amsterdam from the Dutch, which was swiftly renamed to New York. The monarchy would soon find itself in trouble again when Charles' son, James II, converted to Catholicism. Oops. Protestant England was none too pleased about this, and so some lords asked the Dutch William of Orange to become King of England, which he did in 1688. So, and William uh, of Orange was a... Um, he had been a nephew of the previous king, so he's a cousin to King James, uh, who comes and basically usurps his cousin. And his wife, um, 
so basically, William and Mary, William and his wife Mary, and James are all grandchildren in the same family. So it's another family squabble. William's ascendancy to the throne caused a major French-supported uprising in Ireland, which was eventually quashed. Scotland also tried its hand at colonisation during the period by founding Nova Scotia in modern-day Canada, which New was Scotland. to the French. The most notorious attempt at Scottish Empire building was the founding of the colony at Caledonia in what is now Panama in 1698, which was claimed by Spain. The colony failed due to disease in a Spanish blockade, and the English refused to help because they didn't want to provoke war. Welcome. No English. So, Scotland and England are united under one crown, but they're still separate countries. They're just in a union of the crowns. It's not until... Um, the I think the first decade of the 1700s that Scotland and England are actually united uh, under one government. What makes Caledonia so notable was the cost of its failure, since the venture had cost Scotland almost a fifth of its national wealth and bankrupted the kingdom. Thus, the Scottish and English empires at the turn of the 18th century looked like this. In return for England financing there Scotland's is. debts, both kingdoms were unified by the 1707 Act of Union which gave birth to Great Britain. Great Britain immediately found itself caught up in numerous European wars. From the War of the Spanish Succession, Britain gained Gibraltar in southern Spain and large swathes of French territory in Canada. Next came the War of the Austrian Succession, which wasn't very important to Empire, except that it paved the way for a much more important war, the Seven Years' War. The Seven Years' War was a global conflict which saw British victory and saw the transfer of a great deal of North American territory to Britain. From if you grew up in the United States, the French and Indian War. The French and Indian War was the North American part of the larger Seven Years' War, uh, which it could be argued easily the Seven Years' War was a world war uh, in many ways. Um, and uh, the part in North America pretty much started by a young uh, militia officer named George Washington. From France and Spain. It should be noted here that for many of these countries, the wars were nothing more than excuses to seize each other's territories. Yeah. The war also spread to India, where the British and French were trying to squeeze each other out. The reason for this was that trade with India was incredibly lucrative. It focused mainly on textile, spices, and the most important consumer good of all time, tea. And um, we were talking a while back uh, on a video about the Napoleonic Wars. And I had posed the question then, um, because... England was throwing money at Napoleon's enemies. Even when they weren't militarily involved, they were just throwing large amounts of money at Napoleon's enemies. And I had thrown the question up then, where's England getting all the money? Because this is only a few years after they had taxed the North American colonies uh, because they were short on money after financing the French and Indian War. And they were trying to get that money back. Well, in the meantime, between the, the revolution... Uh, the American Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars 30 years later, India, that's where they're getting their money. So by the beginning of the Seven Years' War, the East India Company had already established factories along the coastline of India, much of which was controlled by either the Mughal or Maratha empires. The company was largely independent and even had its own military. The company was also deeply involved in Indian politics and were very good at playing Indian lords, called Nawabs, off of each other for British benefit. Robert Clive, also known as Clive of India, led the East India Company forces there. The British won a decisive victory against the Indians at the Battle of Plassey, mostly due to some double dealing. After defeating the French, the Dutch, and later the Mughals, British territory in India looked like this. And one of the people who ends up in India is Lord Cornwallis, who was famously uh, defeated at Yorktown and had to surrender to George Washington. Uh, he's actually buried in India. That's where he lived the last years of his life. Bengal was particularly important since it had a taxable population twice the size of Britain. After the wars, the company began to levy heavy taxes against the locals and Bengal quickly became an extremely important revenue stream for Britain. Robert Clive was for a short period the governor of Bengal and one of his policies was to force local farmers to grow opium for export to China instead of food, which meant that whenever crops failed, large numbers of Bengali people starved. Britain colonial successes in India were contrasted by its failings in North America. The number of soldiers, tax disputes, and lack of representation in the British Parliament led the 13 colonies to declare their independence. The Americans were led by General George Washington, who would later become the first President of the United States of America. Britain at first was able to win some major victories, but after years of attrition, alongside the French and Spanish aiding the Americans, the British accepted American independence and lost all of this territory. Washington with a couple of notable exceptions, never wins a battle against the British. I mean, he, he spends eight years in command of the uh, Continental Army, and 
with him on the field, there's Trenton and Princeton, uh, and there's very few other. I mean, obviously Yorktown. This was a war of attrition. This was not about winning battles on the on the field. This was about outlasting the British Empire till they were tired of the men, the money, and the materials that they were wasting trying to hold on to the colonies, and they finally, public sentiment turned against them, which it did, and that's how they won. Uh, he held his army together, but he didn't win victory after victory in the battlefield. Uh, by and large, he got his butt kicked in most of the major battles. The birth of the British Empire was a slow and drawn out process. The reasons for colonial expansion were diverse, ranging from religious calling to the desire for wealth. Colonial failure led to the creation of Great Britain, but colonial success meant that warfare now had a global scope and it became increasingly difficult for the rest of the world to stay uninvolved from European politics. I hope you enjoyed this video and thank you for watching. And there is a second part to this that we will get into. Um, for those of you who have been voting on Patreon for our next series, that new series, whatever you guys have chosen, and it looks like it's going to come down to one of two, um, whatever you choose, we will start that on Monday, that new series. So we'll get through the weekend. Uh, this weekend, we're going to have a live stream that's open to everybody. We're also going to do a private live stream for our patrons and our members here on YouTube. So be watching for announcements about those. Check out Patreon if you would. Let's get that number of patrons up to 500. Thanks for watching.